many ways, like I say, every class is the most important. Well, every class is important, but of course, Jesus is the source of our whole faith. Everything leads to Jesus Christ. He's our Lord and Savior. And I want to speak about, sort of in this class, go through the story of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, what does his death and resurrection mean for us? Okay, especially his passion and death and resurrection. Uh, Full Machine would say that Jesus Christ was the only uh, baby born to die. In other words, his mission was to become one of us to die for our sins. Okay? Now, in the creed, um, we say in the creed, um, hopefully all of you are at this point beginning to attend Mass on Sundays, okay? And if not, I would really invite you at this point is to really come, even though you cannot partake of the Eucharist yet, I would ask you to really come and to um, just listen and worship with us because this is the Mass is going to be the most powerful thing you do every week. But right after the homily, I say what's called the Nicene Creed. We stand and we profess our faith. And tonight, uh, we, we're going to focus on this part. And we believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. All right? So this is what we believe about Jesus Christ. Now, first off, we know that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. Everything in the Bible, remember we talked about this, points to the person of Jesus Christ. Everything points to Jesus. Because Jesus is our salvation. Now, I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And if you turn to Isaiah 7, 14, we see the prophet Isaiah will prophesize, and he said there this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. Now, we know from Christmas songs, you've probably heard Emmanuel. Do you know what the name Emmanuel means? It means God is with us. Okay? That God is with us. So we see in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah prophesied that there would be a boy, a man, born of a virgin, and conceived, and his name, he will be Emmanuel. God will be with us. He's the anointed one. If you turn to... You don't have to because I'll read it, but if you want to, turn to Micah, the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. And the prophet Micah says this, he says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me, one who will rule over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And so we see that the, that the Jesus Christ, this Savior, will be born in this little town called Bethlehem. All right, And then we'll see also in the prophet Isaiah that he will take upon our sins. And the prophet Isaiah, when we get to that, when we get to the crucifixion and death of our Lord. Now, what are the four reasons that Jesus became, a, God became a man? All right, number one, to save us by reconciling us with God. Now, the word Jesus literally means what? The translation of Yeshua, or Jesus, and it was, it, it, it was actually a common name. Not, I mean, there would probably be other little baby Jesuses and boys around the town, just like there are Johns and Pauls. But the word, the name Jesus means what? God saves. Now, we know, as Christians, that God saves us from what? Our sin. Now the Israelites, they believed that this Messiah would be more like a political savior. Because if you look at the history of the Israelites, they're constantly in slavery. You know, like, they, 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 they start worshiping God and they fall away and then God puts them into captivity. They're in captivity, the Egyptians, the Babylonians. And at the time of Christ, who were they in captivity under? The Roman Empire. And they were slaves to the Romans. And they thought that this Jesus would be one to conquer the Romans and lead them into freedom. But that's not what the plan, why God became a man. God became a man to break that curse that we talked about in the creation class, the curse of sin. The 
There are three S's that Jesus saves us from. Sin, sick, sickness, and Satan. Sin, sickness, and Satan. Okay? Now, secondly, Jesus became a man to, so that we know God's love. John will say, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son to become with us and then ultimately to die for us. You know, one of the questions that people will watch a little snippet from The Passion of the Christ. Have you ever watched that movie, by the way? Mel Gibson's? It's rough, isn't it? Now, how many people have watched that the whole way through without crying? Nobody. And when you watch that movie, and I think Mel Gibson did such a powerful, beautiful job with that movie. And when it came out, it was actually was very scandalous. Um, there were some priests and bishops that thought that the Holy Father, John Paul II, should tell Catholics not to watch it because it was too brutal. And John Paul II, when he saw the movie, he simply said this, it is as it was, and they should watch it. Because he knew that people needed to see how much God loves them. Because the passion of Jesus shows us two things. What sin does and how it hurts God, which it does, and it hurts us as humans. But how much God was willing to put on the line out of love to save us. The crucifixion is a sign of God's love. Number three, Jesus came to be our model of holiness. You know, a lot of times people say, well, who goes to heaven? Good people. Who's good? Who are you comparing yourself to? Really, the model of holiness, if we're willing to believe this, we are to become like Christ. Uh, the other day, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was at a baseball game, and a couple priests, parishioners invited us to use this box. It was awesome. And um, the mascot, his name is Pinch, came into our room. And he was kind of like walked in a little bit awkward in the suit, and he wasn't speaking, so I was like, hey, how you doing? And he was kind of like, Ur. And then, uh, and then at one time, I, I, I kind of turned to him and said, um, hey, great to meet you. Would you like to spend time? He, goes, he kind of went like this. And then he goes like this with his claw. He's like, come here. And it's like, I went up. He goes, I want to talk to you. <laughs> okay. So I said, what is it? He goes, can I talk to you like the seventh inning stretch? I'm like, sure. So he comes back into the seventh inning. Sure enough, this eight-year-old kid comes in. He's out of his suit. And he goes, I'm really struggling with my faith. I said, all right, well, where do you go to church? And he, I think it's the Southern Baptist, the Baptist church down the street like past new life. He says, I'm not connected to God in anything. And so we started talking about the differences of Catholicism and Christianity. And at one point I said, well, you ever thought about becoming Catholic? He said, oh man, you are too strict. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. I said, hold on one moment. I said, imagine. I said, look out on that field. I said, wouldn't it be neat if I had some sort of secret serum that I can inject into you that would make you act like those ball players, and you can walk out, your game would be brought to the whole new level, and you could play at that level. Would you do it? And he's like, yeah, man. I said, well, that's what Catholicism is. <laughs> yes, we do play at a whole new level, but God also gives us so many powerful means to be able to live the life of a Catholic. And we'll talk about that. What's the difference? The sacraments. But... Why? We ultimately need to become like Christ, and we can't do it without His help. But the Catholic Church has given us, the Church has given us, the means of holiness to become like Christ. Now number four, tied in with this, Jesus became a man to make us partakers of divine nature. What's another word for divine nature? Grace. We don't go to heaven because we're good, we go to heaven because God gives us His grace. Another way of looking at grace is gift received at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. Gift, it's free. Received, we have to receive the grace at Christ's expense. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we can receive the life of God in us. All right. 
St. Irenaeus says, For the Son of God became man so that we might become God. And that's, a, that's actually in the Catechism. Let me read that again. For the Son of God became man so that we might become God, like God. That God takes on our weak human nature, but what does he give us back? His divine nature. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? <laughs> Alright, in other words, you have to understand this, that there's this, this divine exchange that God wants to give you, and it's called grace. Alright, now, where did this all begin? When, at what moment in the Bible, did Jesus first become a man? It's the first joyful mystery of the rosary. We call it the Annunciation. Now remember, I think it was the second class for the creation class, we talked about how Mary is the new Eve. Right? We talked about how Mary, uh, Eve disobeyed God and because of her disobedience, sin came into the world. Years later, remember, there was a woman that God said would say yes and because of her fiat, her yes, that, she, that there would be a savior that would break the curse. Who is that woman for us? It's Mary. And we see that conceived of the, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, turn your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 1. Because in many ways, this is a pinnacle point in salvation history for us. When Mary said yes to the, the angel Gabriel, and God became a man. So if you go to Luke chapter 1, and you go to, give me one second, I'll turn with you. Okay, one second. Okay, turn to uh, Luke chapter 1, um, verse 26, okay? It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph to the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, favor one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said, and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name, name him Jesus. Remember, what does Jesus mean? God saves. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with the man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore the child will be born, we call holy the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. And this is the key word. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it done to me according to your word. Now notice she breaks the curse. And she says yes. She says, remember, Eve takes, and what does Mary do? She receives God's invitation, God's grace. All right? And at that moment, she conceived of Jesus in her womb. Now, what is that called? That episode, and I've actually been to the spot, the very spot where this happened in Nazareth. It's underneath an, uh, an altar. And I can't remember how they say it in Latin, but it's in Latin. But it says, and the word became flesh in Latin. And you can kiss the spot where Mary actually said yes to be the mother of God. Very, and I actually was able to, I wasn't a priest at the time, but I was actually able to uh, assist at a mass where my confessor celebrated mass on that altar where it all began. Very powerful. All right, now we call this, this is called the incarnation. The incarnation. That's when, when the word God, Jesus, became flesh. All right, now what do we believe about Jesus Christ? Jesus, remember, now we talked, let's kind of go back to last class. 
Remember we talked about those terms person and what was the other word? Nature. And we talked about the different persons of the Trinity, right? And what were the three persons? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's who they are. And what's the nature of them? They're all what? They're all God. Okay? So there's three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Now, when the Word became flesh, Jesus Christ actually has, right? He has two natures. He has two intellects. Okay? He also has two wills. We believe that Jesus Christ is 100% God, but also 100% man. That Jesus had a human mind. There are certain things that Jesus learned from experience. His mother taught him, or father, how to walk. He learned things like we do experientially as we do as human persons. But at the same time, he's also God and knows he's God. So there were certain things that he had to experience as a human person, but at the same time he's God. True God and true man. He also had a human will and a divine will. All right? We see in the Garden of Gethsemane where he struggled in his humanity with this. The next day he was going to die on a cross and he was asked, Lord, he's like, if this, you know, not my will, but your will be done. He started bleeding. You know, he's so scared that he had this human will that he said yes to God, but he also had a divine will that says, I will, I am God, and my will is the same as the Father. There's two wills. All right? And there's two natures in Jesus Christ. He's both God, and he's also man. The most powerful thing about the teaching of Jesus Christ is you can never say that Jesus doesn't understand me. Why? It says in Scripture that Jesus shared everything with us except for what? Sin. He experienced loneliness. He experienced suffering. He experienced being homeless. He experienced losing a friend. He experienced everything. He even experienced temptation, but he never what? Sinned. We do not have a God that cannot sympathize with us because Jesus took upon our what? Our human nature. And in return, he gives us what? His divine nature. You see? So, I, I, you know, we're going to kind of shift gears. But you understand that? The important things about Jesus and what this is called, right? Here's the college word. I don't expect you to remember this. And... And you might get brownie points at a cocktail party for remember this. Does anyone know when these two natures come together? It's called the hypostatic union. Okay? Everyone say that. <laughs> hypostatic union. Okay. Yes. A great... Uh, so these are the two natures that become one. The divine nature and human nature become one. Great. Awesome. All right. Now, let's move on. <laughs> now, from there, we go on to when Jesus was born. And let's talk a little bit about the birth of Jesus. Now, we know that Jesus Christ was born in a little town called Bethlehem. Does anyone know what, what the word Bethlehem means? If it translates into maybe more an English word. Yeah, it means, Bethlehem means house of bread. And it's really interesting about God. He was so humble that the Lord God, who is the King of Heaven, all right, lowers himself and is born in a cave in extreme poverty. It says that one of the saddest lines in sacred scripture is, you know, Mary's pregnant and Joseph's knocking on the doors, right? And he's like, hey, my wife's about to have a baby. And like, sorry, pal, no room in the inn. I always thought, like, can you imagine being that guy when you die and you have to meet the Lord? <laughs> you remember my mom <laughs> when she was pregnant, you didn't let her in? <laughs> you know? But you know, that line of scripture, there's no room in the inn, 
is for all those who have no time for Jesus. They cram them out of their life. I don't have time for God or prayer. That stuff's boring, man. I, I don't need him. You know, that there has to be room in the end. And then when Jesus is born, in this extreme poverty, he's wrapped in swaddling clothes, and Mary lays him in what? A manger. Now, if you're Italian, the word to eat is what? Manja. And a manger is a place of eating. And so right in the beginning of Jesus Christ's life, we see this depiction of what would happen. Jesus is born in the house of bread, the bread of life, in place in a place of eating. Just like at one time, we as Catholics would receive Jesus in the form of bread. It all points to the Eucharist and what would happen. You see? All right, so we have this, and then we see the angels come and, and, they, and they sing his praises, and pretty much no one knows that Jesus is born. He kind of is born, and really, no one cares. It just was a, this humble birth. All right, now, a little bit later, we celebrate, the week after Christmas, we celebrate the Feast of what? The three kings we call the Epiphany. Now, the three kings come from different lands. And they come and they adore the Lord. It says they fell prostrate in front of Jesus Christ. Why is that significant for us as Christians? Well, these are not Jewish people. These are kings from other religions. And those three kings represent all the non-Jewish people where Jesus Christ didn't come just to save the Jewish people, but he came to save what? The whole world. What's the word Catholic mean? The word Catholic means universal. And this little baby came not just to save the Israelites, the Jewish people, he came to save all people, all races, all lands. And later, before Jesus would ascend into heaven, the last words of Jesus Christ, Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then a little bit later, we see that he is, uh, you know, he has to escape and go to Egypt. Remember, his father has a dream. You know, I always meditate on that. Every time Joseph got a dream, his life had to take a complete left turn. You know, one of my priest friends says, no more, no more dreams, God. I'm done with this. Because every time he got a dream, it was something else. It's something life-changing. And there was some suffering that he had to go through. But Joseph, who's kind of the unsung hero, he was always obedient to God. He didn't speak. He just did God's will. He was a silent witness of what it means to be a Christian. And then we kind of jump ahead. And we know very little about Jesus from the time... Really, from the time he's a little baby until he shows up again when he's 12 years old. What happened when he was 12? Remember that scene? The parents of Jesus were taking him to Jerusalem for a pilgrimage, and guess what happened? They lost Jesus. It's like, I'm sure all your parents have had an experience where you got in the car, or maybe it was just my parents, got home <laughs> and realized someone was missing. Now, when you're one of 10, that happens like every other trip. We were so-and-so. Whoops. And uh, it was funny. My brother, Jimmy, when we were in Ellicott City, Maryland, there was a, we went to the 5 o'clock Mass. There was a snowstorm. And my parents, no matter what, we would never miss Mass. So Dad's like, we're going to Mass. We're going to go to the 5 o'clock Mass. We're going to make it back before the snowstorm. Well, sure enough, Mass starts. The snowstorm we're leaving. There's about four inches on the ground already. We come home, and it's time for dinner, and we can't find Jimmy. So, like, hours go by, and then we get this phone call. He was in the church for three hours, for like two hours in the church, you know. He still hasn't gotten over it, all right, but he's still a Catholic. <laughs> but imagine this, so we, we know this, and he was there, and they found him, and they said, where were you? And he said, I was doing my father's will, and he was teaching these scribes and Pharisees, these teachers of the law, and he was, like, showing them what the Bible meant, like, who does this 12-year-old, where did he get all this? But then after that, we know nothing about Jesus until he's 30. And we call them what? The hidden 
ears of Christ. Now, I want you to meditate on that for a moment. Why is it we know nothing about the hidden ears of Jesus Christ? Well, the church, when I say the church, how we translate that, that sort of gap, it says this. This is to show us how the holiness can be found in the ordinary things of life. Work, taking care of the house, obeying parents, and staying faithful in prayer. Just doing your ordinary duties. And you think about it. Jesus Christ, what did he do from the time he was probably 12 until he was 30? We know from sacred scripture he was a carpenter. And how we know he was a pretty dang good carpenter. So, everything changes though when he turns 30. And we see Jesus Christ sort of come out of obscurity at the age of 30. And we know this about him, that what changed Jesus from being just that ordinary guy to everyone like, whoa, this guy is superhuman. What did he do that proves that he's God? What do we call that? Miracles. Okay, commercial break. And I want to show, how many have seen the movie Jesus of Nazareth? Did you see that movie a long time ago? Okay, yeah, great movie. I want to show one of my favorite scenes. It's the raising of Lazarus. Okay, and many people say, I mean, you could just imagine you were there, or just imagine this. This is one of Jesus' best friends. And according to scriptures, he got a sort of a telegram saying, hey, Lazarus is really sick. Can you come pray with him? And he's like, he kind of delayed. And by the time he got there, it's almost like if a priest got a phone call saying, hey, mom's dying, can you hurry up? I'm like, hold on, let me get some lunch first. And then I get to the hospital, it's too late. And then the two sisters that were good friends of Jesus, Martha and Mary, they're crying and say, Jesus, if you had been here, you would have saved my, your friend, my brother. Okay, so let's watch this miracle, then we'll kind of, this is the miracle, actually, this is one of the final miracles of Jesus Christ. And he worked hundreds of miracles. If you look at the scriptures, you know, Jesus, you know, cured the blind, the deaf. He did raise other people from the dead. That wasn't the only incident. But this was the final miracle that we believe was, and we look at the scriptures, this is when they wanted to really put him to death. Because they're thinking, now everyone's starting to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And so the Jewish people, the leaders, accused him of blasphemy. And what is blasphemy? Claiming that he is God. But we know it wasn't blasphemy. He was indeed God. So we're going to tr kind of transition into what's called the Paschal Mystery, the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, and this is all played out as Catholics during Holy Week. Now, I kind of didn't go into his preaching and teaching, but if you look at the Bible, Jesus gives us a whole new way of living. And I think one part of the scriptures you should read, if you want to know how we're supposed to live, is Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. Not the Sermon of the Amount <laughs> on money. All you Catholics do is talk about money. I've never talked about money. But the Sermon on the Mount is a new way of living where Jesus says, because I have died for you and because I have risen from the dead, you can live a whole new way. In other words, you can conquer your anger. Because Jesus will say, if someone strikes you on their right cheek, what does he say? Give them the other one as well. Now, what does that mean if we were to break that down? And I'll give you a, a few examples. Now, if I were to strike you on your right cheek, I'd either have to use my left hand, or I'd have to what? Backhand you. And so the idea of hitting on the right cheek is if you get insulted, Jesus says, don't insult back. Now that's a nice theory until what? You're insulted. Jesus says, was asked, you know, he says, a couple weeks ago, he says, 
Peter says, should I forgive seven times? And what did Jesus say back to him? No. I want you to forgive 70 times seven times. In other words, if we always forgive. C.S. Lewis says that forgiveness is a great idea until you have to actually forgive someone. You know, and he, there's many other teachings that Jesus gave us. But it's not that we can do this. He's saying, with my grace, I will make it that you'll be able to do this because I've done it for you. Okay? Now, let's transition into what's called the Paschal Mystery. How many here know what Holy Week is? Okay, three of you. Praise God. All right, Holy Week, and this is going to be the greatest week of your entire life. I promise. Holy Week is Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and then the Easter Vigil, where many of you will receive the sacraments. Now, what happened on Holy Thursday? On Holy Thursday, Jesus Christ would do something very profound at the Last Supper. They would celebrate the Passover meal, but he would do something different. He would give us a great gift. And we're going to go much more into detail later when we talk about priesthood and the Eucharist. But the Passover meal, because we have to understand this, why did Jesus have to die? Jesus had to die for our sins because every sin is an infinite offense or our sin is against an infinite God. So nothing we can do can make up for that because we're finite. We're just humans. We're creatures. And we're sinning against an infinite God. And so only a sacrifice that was infinite could make up for something that was an infinite offense. Did I lose you? You did. Okay, I lost you. Alright. God is infinite. So let's pretend you're God. And thank God you're not God. Alright? And let's say I sin against you. That sin or that fault is infinite because I sinned against an infinite being. So nothing I can do can make up for what I did to you. Unless you were to provide a sacrifice that was like yourself. Alright, now, the Passover meal, what was it? Every year, the Jewish people would get together and they would celebrate or relive the Passover meal that happened in Egypt. Remember, there were ten plagues. And the last plague was what? Pharaoh would not let his people go. And the last plague was this. He was going to send the angel of death. And the angel of death would kill the firstborn child of every family unless they did something. And what did they have to do? The father of the family had to get a lamb. And it had to be a perfect lamb. It had to be a male lamb. And it had to be without blemish. It had to be young, without blemish. And they would sacrifice the lamb. The father would eat a part of the lamb. And then the family would eat the rest. And what do they do with the blood? They put the blood on the doorpost. And then that night, the angel of death passed over all the houses where they saw the blood. And any houses that didn't get that email <laughs> lost their firstborn child. And one of the guys that lose his firstborn child was Pharaoh. And after we got up, and he was so just done with Moses and done with the plagues, he says, get out of here. And Moses was like, praise the Lord. Finally, after 400 years, we're free. So every year, once a year, they would celebrate this with the Passover meal. Now, Jesus would take bread at one point and he would change the Passover meal. He'd say, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body given up for you. So Jesus is saying, I am the sacrifice that will destroy sin and death. 
Just like the lamb that was, you know, thousands of years ago that set the people free. I am the lamb of God that will set humanity free from sin. Now we'll get more into that. But in the Jewish tradition, every year, every year, on Friday, the, it's called the Day of Atonement, they would sacrifice 250,000 lambs for the sins of the people. Now that was a bloody mess. Now, so what you do is once a year, the father of the family would bring a sacrifice to the temple, and it was kind of funny because it depended on how much sin was going on in your family, you had a bigger animal. So if you were like the guy with the bull, they're like, well, he had a rough beard, you know? And if you had turtle doves, it meant that you probably, okay, you're a couple of venial sins, whatever. All right, but there was this idea that we had to sacrifice. But the problem with the sacrifice is what? It couldn't make up for sin. All that blood spilled couldn't make up for sin. Now, it's really interesting, if you study this, Jesus came five days, he came to Jerusalem five days before he was crucified, and that was the moment that the priest would choose the best lamb, the last lamb to be sacrificed at that moment. There was one lamb that was going to be the final one. And interesting enough, do you know when that lamb would be sacrificed? Three o'clock in the afternoon. All right. So he goes in and, and he is... He is crucified. Now, I want to make this point. Did Jesus have to do it that way? In other words, if you look at the passion and death of Jesus Christ, it was absolutely brutal. And most historians or anyone who studied the life of Christ say that no one in the history of the world has ever suffered more than Christ. There's not one person that's ever suffered more than Jesus Christ. Now, I, I, I want to show like a little clip from the Passion and then tie it in what does it mean for us, okay? So once again, we have a commercial break. Bill. And I've seen that movie about 18 times, uh, mostly in the seminary, and like maybe three times a priest. I should watch it more as a priest. But... It goes back to Isaiah. Open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53, 10 to 12. And turn to... Actually, turn to uh, 53. Let's do 4 to 6, okay? Isaiah 53, 4 to 6. And it says this. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore... Our sufferings he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses and crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. Upon him was the punishment that makes us whole. So the punishment we deserve for sin, God took upon himself. Now, when you go into a Catholic church, what's the first thing you usually staring at you, hanging high? The crucifix. Now, in non-Catholic churches, like, we're not about the crucifix. Well, as Catholics, we are. Because it's a reminder of us of what God did for us but it also shows how much God loved us. So, in a sacrifice, there is four parts. Number one, there has to be an offering. Jesus offered his body and his life. Number two, you had to destroy the offering. You had to kill the offering. Jesus died and took upon himself our death. Number three, there had to be a minister or a priest. Well, who is the priest and the crucifixion? Jesus was both the priest and the victim. Because he's freely, what? Offering himself for our sins. And then finally, 
there has to be a profession of the supreme dominion of God and God himself was taking back what was rightfully his which is us and he stripped us back from the grip of Satan there's a beautiful scene at the end of the Passion of Christ when the last tear there's a tear from heaven that hits the ground and the ground opens up and you see Satan just screaming remember that scene? okay, never mind. Go look it up on YouTube all right, and the, and the thing is that because Satan realized I've been crushed and no longer are we if we don't want to be have to be in the grips of Satan because Jesus destroyed the power of Satan on the cross okay now I'm going to turn this around here um, literally because if I flip it it won't work now it's not the Jewish people that put Jesus to death 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. It was foretold. And the catechism in number 598 says, sinners were the authors and the ministers of all the sufferings that the divine redeemer endured. Who crucified Jesus? I did. And you did. Every time we sin, we crucified him. And Jesus knew on the cross that we did that. But he took upon himself our infirmities, as it says in the prophet of Isaiah. The interesting thing is that God did not take away suffering, did he? But on the cross, he redeems it, and he gives even our own sufferings meaning. We'll talk about that more later. Okay? But it is the... It, now, the, the, let's kind of... What is the meaning of the crucifixion? The Council of Trent, it's a, don't worry about where, it's the Middle Ages, said this, that the Christ sacrifice on the cross is, quote, the source of eternal salvation. Because Jesus died on the cross, it is the source of our salvation. Why can we go back to heaven? Why can we be set free from sin? Jesus died on the cross. And through his death, the forgiveness of sins is what? accomplished. Now what did Jesus say? What was the final words of Jesus on the cross? He said, it is finished. What needed to be done to save our sin has been accomplished. Okay? So, now, here's where it gets a little bit tricky. Jesus redeemed is a redemptive act, but it's up to us whether or not we want to accept that. In other words, did Jesus Christ die for every person in the world? Every person in this room? Yes. But we have to give an assent of faith and to receive that grace is namely through the sacraments in order to receive that grace. Now you're going to see later how the Mass is the same sacrifice of Calvary, where we receive the graces of Calvary when we go to Mass. I don't want you to go too far in that right now. You're not ready for that. When you go to confession, many of you will make your first confession, you're cashing in to the cross of Jesus Christ. You're cashing in. And Jesus takes all he sins upon himself and gives you back forgiveness and mercy through his precious blood, through the minister of the priest, who is Jesus himself. Okay? And it's not just a matter of just believing. We have to make an ascent of faith. Now, all right, so I think we're going to move on to the rest, to the, he descended into hell. And we might not be able to finish all of it today, but let's see how far we go. So he suffered, died, was buried. And then what does it say? He descended into hell. Now what does it mean that Jesus descended into hell? Did Jesus Christ descend into the place of damnation? No. Jesus Christ descended, the catechism calls it, a place called Sheol. It was the place of the dead where, for lack of a better word, righteous followers of the Messiah or, or the, the promised people 
were kept, but they couldn't go to paradise because paradise was locked. Until what? Until Jesus opened the gates of paradise with his death. So he descended into this place of Sheol, this place of the dead. And there's an early uh, church homily. And if you have your catechism, um, turn to number 635 in your catechism. It's kind of a neat little incident here. And there's a homily. This is after Jesus was in the... He says, Today a great silence reigns on earth. A great silence and a great stillness. A great silence because... It's, this is on 635, the little print. The earth trembled and is still because God has fallen asleep in the flesh and he has raised up all who have slept ever since the world began. He has gone to search for Adam, our first father, as for a lost sheep. Greatly desiring to visit those who live in darkness in the shadow of death, he has gone to free from the sorrow of Adam and his bonds and Eve captive with him. He went in search of Adam and Eve, the first ones who sinned, to let them out of this place of waiting that they had been there since they died. Can you imagine how happy Adam was? It's time to go home. Did you ever see an old crucifix, like the old school crucifixes, Underneath the crucifix is a skull and bones. Do you ever see this? All right. If you have like old school Italian parents, take a look at their crucifixes. And underneath the cross is always a cruc is always a skull and bone. Now, have any of you ever been to Jerusalem? All right. I was lucky to go to Jerusalem, and I actually spent the whole night there in prayer. Spent, they locked me in with a couple of friends, and it was fun until like five in the morning. They're like, "Okay, let's get out of here." And there actually is a place underneath where Jesus was crucified. If you go in sort of the basement, there's a place they believe where Adam was buried. And they believe, they've always believed, that Jesus was crucified right over his grave. And that remember when the, crap, the uh, ground opened up? That literally the blood of Christ would have touched his skull. That he was freed from sin because of the sacrifice of Christ. And then that night, that Saturday night, everyone's sleeping, he busts open the gates and says, Adam and Eve and all you others, King David, let's go. And he brings them to paradise. Right? And how do, who do we believe is probably the first person to go to paradise? The good thief. Remember, he's on the cross and he says, ah, come on. And he says, you know, the other guy's mocking him. And then Jesus says, a good thief, this day you will be with me where? In paradise. So he descended into, the hell, into hell, but not the place of, of, of the Dan, but the place of, the, for those who were not baptized. And, um, okay. Now, and then the greatest thing happened. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. Now, this is the most important thing that ever happened in the history of the world. And we believe that if Jesus Christ had not risen, then our faith is in vain. But they've never found the bones of Christ. And they never will. And Jesus himself raised himself from the dead. Okay, it was the greatest miracle. And it's the source of all our faith. If they ever found that if there was a lie, then my job's over, we should just shut down our CIA. All right, let's try something else. But the truth is that Jesus, what? Rose from the dead. Now, what is the proof that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, they found the empty tomb. Okay. We see in Scripture that he appeared to over 500 people at one time. Okay. Um, we also know that he prophesied in Mark 8.31, Mark 10.31. In both of these scriptures, he said, on the third day, I'll rise again. And exactly what he said happened. Now, we know in the scriptures that some of the soldiers tried to make it look like there was grave robbers. Okay, But there's an interesting point in the resurrection narrative. That's when everyone goes to church. You've probably heard this one before. <laughs> Eastern Christmas, right? That's when everyone goes to Mass. 
But if you really listen during Christmas and Easter, you notice when they go to the tomb, the clothes are folded up. Now, if you're going to steal a body, are you going to sit there and fold your clo fold the clothes? No. And the in in uh, in the Jewish tradition, like when you're when you go to a restaurant, um, when you're finished, you usually take the the napkin, you just put this side. Um, or you fold it up means you're finished. But if you're coming back, in our tradition, you just go to put it somewhere. To, in the Jewish tradition, if you fold something up, it means I'm coming back. In other words, Jesus is making it simple. I'm coming back to judge the living and the dead. I'm alive. Okay? So we know Jesus rose from the dead. And then, um, alright, number what are the three things that the resurrection uh, proves? It proves that Jesus has gotten our faith is true. That we, this is how we receive the grace in the life of Christ, and that we know now our bodies are, and souls are allowed to go to heaven. And then finally, he ascended to heaven and will come to judge the living and the dead. And so after Jesus' resurrection, and, and I believe Mel Gibson is coming out with a new movie on the resurrection, which I think will be awesome. Maybe like a parish you know, field trip, right? Um, you know, to see that movie, right? Mel Gibson does powerful movies. But he's going to do one of the resurrection. But after Jesus rose from the dead, he was with his apostles for 40 days. And after 40 days, he went to Bethany, and there he gave his marching orders to go there for make disciples of all nations. He told them to wait in the upper room because he would send them what? The Holy Spirit, which we're going to talk about next class. And then he ascended to heaven, and someday, maybe sooner or later, He's going to come back to judge the living and the dead. It's a great question. Would you like that to happen tomorrow? <laughs> All right, just pray on that. <laughs> St. Augustine, he says, treat your body as you live forever, but treat your soul as you die tomorrow. But you know, if we're believers, like the early Christians, they say, Maranatha. They say, come Lord Jesus. I want you to come back. Because you're playing on your team. Right? And if, we don't, if we're not ready, we just rearrange a little deck furniture, right? And make sure we are ready for that great moment. Okay, let's say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.